inactive neurons are targeted by your immune system for complete destruction. This is just another variation on the theme of use it or lose it. Whichever neurons are just sitting around not pulling any weight, they eventually get tagged with a protein. And that protein tells the microglial cells to get rid of that stinker, it's not doing anything. And then you lose that one and all, all its connections. And that could be a physical mechanism for why even somebody who's extremely good at a musical instrument and doesn't do it for years comes back and they feel very rusty. They, they can't play with the same rapidity and style and verve that they had. Because when they stop practicing and those neurons become idle, your body says, well, look at all this metabolic load we've got here. 15 watts steaming out of this skull. And this guy here is taking energy and food and oxygen and nutrients and blah, 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 and not doing anything. We can prove he hasn't fired in years. Gone. And perhaps when that mechanism goes astray or goes out of whack when you get older, your immune system starts getting rid of even parts of your brain that you would prefer to keep. And then you suffer cognitive loss. And the second is a dual thing. The observation that Europeans are putting on weight, well, as Gomer Pyle would have said, surprise, surprise. Uh, as they've become more like us, driving around everywhere. And the interesting connection here is that you are like a Prius. If you sit down for 20 minutes, it's over. You're on battery power. Your biochemistry detects in 20 minutes that you're bone idle and it shuts down. Because why should it keep metabolizing fat and be ready to run and do things when you aren't doing anything? This is a self-defense mechanism so that you don't run out of energy. However, if you sit down for extended periods and then you eat, you pile it on. Your biochemistry can't believe how, un how fortunate things are. Guess what? I'm like the king of France. I'm sitting down, I'm doing nothing, and I'm getting food handed to me. That never occurred, naturally. You had to climb a tree to get some sour apple. You had to chase something down. You had to at least run after the bugs you were eating because we ate plenty of them. They were much safer to eat than big animals because a big animal might injure you with its great big antlers. And if you got injured, you would often die of infection. If you know that, then you can explain why people who are every day on the treadmill, which I wouldn't recommend at all, are still heavy. There they are. Then what happens? On the way out, 300 calories of something or other, there's three miles down the tube right there. Did you do three miles on the treadmill? Maybe not. Then sit down in your car and then let nature do its work. To defeat that, interestingly, you don't have to be an avid exerciser, but just don't sit down for longer than 20 minutes. Always get up. Do a few deep knee bends. You'll fool your system. It'll say, whoo! It'll keep the fat oxidizing enzymes going, and you'll be able to maintain your weight much more effortlessly 
than by making a big push, being tired, and then the rest of the day you sit around when you aren't keeping track. If you hadn't gone to the gym, you would have walked around a lot more. And so you actually defeat yourself because you pay attention to this big thing like the payoff in Vegas. I'm on the treadmill, I'm doing it. And then the rest of the day when you do nothing, you don't even pay any attention. You say, well, I'm tired. So I want to sit down and I'm hungry. So I want to eat. And then you go backwards. Okay. Let's go on now and talk about equilibrium. First of all, equilibrium is dynamic. We talked about that last time. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is the brown haze over Los Angeles. It, a lot of it comes from cars. It was much, much worse before the days of catalytic converters, which attempt to remove NO from the exhaust flume. And it has an odd number of electrons, which makes it very reactive, and it can dimerize to make N2O4, which is colorless. And if we have a bulb then of NO2, we have a forward reaction which I've just decided to put N2O4 as the reactant, and it falls apart into 2NO2, the revert, and then these sometimes recombine. And at a certain temperature and pressure, there, there will be an equilibrium concentration of these two different molecules in this container. And we know by now that if we press on the container, if we shrink it, by putting pressure on it, that we will favor the reactant because the reactant is less moles of gas. And if we heat it, if it gets hot in the afternoon, then we will favor this. We'll get much more of that coming up. Smog, of course, is much more than just NO2. It's a whole witch's brew of stuff that has to do with photochemistry. And that's why it's much worse in the afternoon. And that's why the time to run is 5 a.m. Because that's when the air is the best and all the idiots driving their cars are not up yet. Because they're still shaking off the night before. And so you're much safer when you cross the road as well because you won't have some car I guess some people have actually been hit on the sidewalk by someone in a car because they're fiddling around doing something else and they jump the curb and then they smash into you. That's really unfortunate, but it does happen. Well, let's suppose we looked in this bulb and we tag, we make an imaginary tag we put a tag on one NO2 molecule, and we follow that guy. Problem is, this is very hard to do because molecules are so tiny, we can't usually see them. But we can imagine it. And if we did that, we'd find that part of the time, it spends its time as NO2 gas, and part of the time, it spends its time as N2O4, as the dimer, hooked up with somebody else. And the bonds, are made and broken and remade all the time. And in fact, if we follow the percentage of time that this guy is either NO2 or N2O4, we'd find that was directly related to what the equilibrium concentration was. So there's a connection between time averages and averages of other properties. And that study of so-called statistical mechanics is a highly interesting thing to engage in in a more advanced course. Let's have a look. Suppose then you don't believe this. You say you told us you should rely on evidence. What you've said is plausible, but what's the evidence? 
that that actually happened. Well, how could we either confirm it or rule it out? And the answer is we could do so by employing isotopes, in this case stable isotopes. We could use nitrogen-15, which is an isotope of nitrogen, rather than nitrogen-14. It has pretty much the same bonding characteristics and everything else as nitrogen-14, but it has an extra neutron in the nucleus. The electrons are pretty much the same. And we could use oxygen-18, which they use in some medical procedures. And we could make some molecules that have N15. First, we make a batch of molecules, N15 and oxygen-16, the abundant isotope. And then we make another bunch that are N14 and O18 in another container. And now we mix the containers. And if after we mix them, we find, by for example, mass spectrometry, we find that there's an O18 N14 hooked to an N15 O16, then we know that they rearrange, that they randomly assorted. If on the other hand, when we prepare this guy and we only find this guy and we only find that guy in the mixture, that's all we find, then we know that they stayed put, that basically they didn't rearrange at all. And when we do this experiment with this uh, particular molecule, we find that they rearrange all the time. And in fact, sort of, the, the presence of both the monomer and the dimer indicates that they have to break, otherwise we wouldn't have both. If you do the same experiment with carbon dioxide and you prepare some carbon dioxide with carbon-13, O16, and then carbon-12, O18, and you mix those together at normal temperature and pressure, there's no exchange. You never find any oxygen moving off one and on to the other. If you go to extremely high temperature, then you can make it happen. But that's extremely high temperature where those bonds can actually break. And if you do the same thing with water, in water, you find that the hydrogens hop around all the time. They fall off, they come on, they go every which way. So they're exchanging quite rapidly in liquid water. Okay, let's have a look at why this bond is so weak. Usually, the Lewis structure is kind of a, a good way to start and look at a bond. And let's then write Lewis structures for NO2 and N2O4. Remember what we have to do. We have to count the valence electrons. We have to know how the atoms are bonded. Because it says NO2, it's going to be N in the middle and two oxygens sticking off like spokes. N2O, which is nitrous oxide, has N, then N, then O. It's different. So let's, let's draw them. There's five valence electrons for nitrogen. There's six for oxygen, but there's two oxygens, so I have 17. This is very rare, because whenever you have an odd number of electrons, that means that you have one unpaired electron somewhere. Those guys are called free radicals. They usually cause mischief because they're quite reactive. And if you ever breathe any NO2, and I have done it by mistake, you never forget it. Because your lungs tighten up and say, that's enough of that. And you, you feel like you need oxygen for the next couple of hours, depending how concentrated it was. So don't try to clean a penny in nitric acid. 
because it won't work. You'll produce NO2 instead, and the penny will disappear. So I tried to make an octet around each, <coughs> each oxygen, and I can do that, but in order to do it, I have to have a minus charge on this oxygen because remember we count one electron for the bond then one, two, three, four, five, six so we count seven electrons but oxygen's group six this has a formal negative charge here we count one electron here one, two, three, four, five, six this has no formal charge so we put nothing and the nitrogen group five we count one, two, three, Four. So he's got a positive charge. And then we can play the usual game of flipping this guy in and flipping this guy out, like playing dominoes, and the negative charge moves back and forth. The actual structure of NO2 is 50% this and 50% that. It's one structure, but we can't write a proper Lewis structure for it like that. So with Lewis structures, when we have more than one resonance structure, what we're saying is uh, the real guy is a mule, but a mule is not a proper species because it's a mixture of a horse and a donkey. And so what we try to do to, to make it look like a mule is we flash a horse 50% of the time and a donkey 50% of the time. And if we flash them very fast, we get kind of an average and that way we can draw a proper Lewis structure for each one and this this is not meant to mean that this is literally happening this is just meant to mean there's a percentage of each in the real structure which is an average which we don't want to draw because then we have to draw dotted lines and funny things and we don't know where the electrons are now I think you can probably see that there's a an electron here and an electron here so I think you can guess how N2O4 is made and I'll let you work out N204 and then I'll probably ask you about it on Tuesday to see if you did it and I think you can see why it's a weak bond because when I make it I have to put those two formal positive charges together and those formal positive charges hate each other and they're close and so that bond is quite weak that means we can break it apart fairly easily. So it's an abnormally weak chemical bond that allows this thing to happen. Now we can uh, take a kinetic view of equilibrium and I'm going to go through quite a lot of mathematics here just so you've seen it, not because I want you to reproduce it but so that you've seen it, so when you see it again, it'll be familiar. The chemical reactions can only happen when atoms or molecules are close enough to make a bond. That basically means the molecules have to collide. So they first have to hit. And we can figure out how often things hit in a gas. They have to collide and if we look at our kinetic theory of gases we know how many are going how fast and we can figure out how many times they hit per second and in a gas it is a very 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 large number of hits at normal pressures so we have the kinetic theory of gases and we can figure out how often the the atoms or molecules are going to collide and if we heat things up, two things happen. They're going to collide more often because everybody's going faster, so it's as if time got shrunk. And when they do collide more often, they're going to hit harder as well, so there's more chance that they hit so hard that something gets knocked off and then you get a reaction initiated. So that's why most reactions speed up in both directions, not just one, but in both directions when we heat things up. And we'll see this in the summer if you're going to continue on in this series in Chem 1C 
with the Arrhenius equation. Okay, let's have a look. Suppose that we are isomerizing cis-butene to transbutene. So we're taking something like this and we're isomerizing it like that, which means we have to formally break the double bond momentarily, slam into it, get this guy to twist and around. And we know from before that usually the transform, when you've got two things sticking out, is slightly more favorable because when you're like this, these guys tend to repel each other a little bit and it puts a little bit of extra energy there that gets released when we go like that. That doesn't mean it's easy to do, but it, it can happen. If we have a forward rate constant, which we call little k for forward, of 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3 per second, and the reverse reaction has a slower rate constant of 4.41 times 10 to the minus 3 per second, and we begin with a mole of cis-butene in a 1 liter flask, what will be the concentration of the two isomers at equilibrium? Okay, well, the forward reaction runs at a rate that depends on, oops, product I meant, of the rate constant and the concentration of cis-butene. It says, however many I've got, this many per second are going to tend to go this way just like a conveyor belt. That makes transbutene. And then the transbutene reacts backward but at a slower rate, more sluggish. And that reverse reaction depletes transbutene. Then the one weapon that we have in this time view of equilibrium is that at equilibrium, whatever the amount of transbutene is, has to be fixed. Because that's what equilibrium means, the concentration's not changing. And that means that the rate of gain plus the rate of loss must equal to zero. So if the money in my bank account every month is the same, that means my income and what I'm spending match. That's the only way it can be the same. Let me say that again. The only way it can be the same is if the amount you get and the amount you spend match. If they're even slightly off, you eventually go into a black hole. If on the other hand, you have a slight surplus every month, you end up in a white hole up here. And that's the correct way to operate, of course much less stressful. Now let's write the rate of gain. The rate of gain depends on the forward plus how much cis-butene is there at equilibrium. And the rate of loss depends on the reverse, but it's negative. I, I write plus, but I write the rate of loss being a negative number, is minus whatever the rate of trans disappearing is times whatever the concentration is at equilibrium. And if, if it is at equilibrium, that should be zero. And if I solve this, I find that the ratio of the forward rate constant to the reverse rate constant is nothing other than the equilibrium concentration of transbutene, the product, divided by the concentration of cisbutene. And that means I can get a number for it. So trans over cis is forward, which is 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3, divided by 4.41 times 10 to the minus 3. 10 to the minus 3's go away, and I get 1.27. Aha, but the concentration of the products at equilibrium divided by the reactants at equilibrium, that's, that's not, none other than K. And so we have a number for K. K, in this case, is 1.27. Not a very favorable reaction, but 
more favorable to make trans than cis. This is a general conclusion. Equilibrium, sorry, I had to abbreviate it, can be viewed as a detailed balance between all the ways that things are made and all the ways that things are destroyed. And at equilibrium, they're being made just as fast as they're being destroyed. It's not that nothing's happening, plenty's happening, but it's all a wash in the end. If you change one of the rate constants, for example, you have two kinds of cells that have to do with your bones, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And one of them tends to make your bones bigger and stronger, and the other one tends to make your bones disappear, get weaker and smaller. If you go up into space and float around in the space station, or you try to go to Mars, which wouldn't be a good idea. Because there's no gravity, the osteoblasts say, guess what? There's no reason on Earth to pile on bone. I'm not feeling anything here. The osteoclasts, however, are always running. And that's the rule, is that the machinery that's tearing you down is always running. So that the minute you stop building yourself up, you go to a lower state. That's again adaptive because you don't want to be trying to maintain gigantic bones and muscles that you don't need. Where are you going to find the stuff to eat to support all that if you're running around in the wild? So if you don't need it, you're going to just get rid of it, just like the brain. And that's why when they come back from the space station, they're basically on a gurney or in a wheelchair because they're so weak, their muscles didn't have anything to stand on. Hey, I don't weigh anything. I'm sitting down all the time. Plus, my blood doesn't even have to work to get back from my calves up to my heart. So my heart turns into this little pathetic thing. Poop, 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 poop and I come back down to gravity and I feel absolutely miserable, weak, bones like balsa wood and so forth. And I expect that if you sent a human to Mars, they wouldn't even be able to get out of the spacecraft if they were the only person because when we take people out, we, we wheel them around and rehab them so that they can get back to normal function. Uh, my view is we might send a robot to Mars, which is made out of metal and doesn't have any active de degradatory mechanism, and that would be fine, because that's not a living thing in the strict sense. So just like water, if we have a bunch of interconnected cisterns, will only be in equilibrium when the water level's at the same, in all of them. So a system, no matter how complex it is, will only be at equilibrium when the rate of production and the rate of destruction of all the molecules in there is equal. Some of them may be destroyed and produced quickly, others may be destroyed and produced slowly. It just depends. And in general, we can write this as a differential equation, and this is what I want you to see, but not necessarily um, digest today. So let's look at the rate of change. This is how the water level's changing. Is it going up or is it going down? What you read, the concentration of trans dt is just the rate of change. And because I don't want to write the concentration of trans everywhere, I'll just write that as TR, and I'll write concentration of, of cis as C. Then we can get a differential equation. The rate of change of the trans 
depends on the rate of production, Kf times C, and the rate of destruction, minus Kr, the reverse reaction, times trans. And we can simplify this equation because in this case I said we started with one mole and so there's always one mole of material in there, it's either cis or trans. And that means we can substitute for C 1 minus TR. So now we have a differential equation that involves the derivative of TR with respect to time and a bunch of stuff that has TR in it. This is called an ordinary differential equation. It's ordinary because this is a regular D and not the funny D. Different, yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the rate of production of the product. And it's, it's made by the reactant making the product, and it's subtracted by the product going backwards and making the reactant. You can solve these uh, with Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha. It'll solve them for you. Um, but until you learn how to solve them yourself at least a little, the solution may not mean much. It just looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. So you're none the problem is, often you can get the answer and you haven't learned anything. And that's something to remember when you say, what's the answer? If somebody tells you the answer, you haven't learned anything. Okay? If you get the answer yourself, you have learned something. Let's put in the numbers that we have. We have those rate constants, so we have now a numerical equation. The rate of change of the concentration of trans with respect to time is equal to 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3, that's this thing <coughs> times 1, and then these guys I put together, minus 1 times 10 to the minus 2. Okay, we solve this by separating variables. If you can separate variables, you can solve the differential equation instantly. And what separating variables means is get everything with the, with the DTR and TR on one side, and then get everything with T and DT on the other side. This equation is easy because this side doesn't have anything that has t in it. If I had another term here, plus t squared, or something awful like that, then that would be much, much, much harder for us to solve. Because now I've got something else going on. It's as if not only am I trying to have it come to equilibrium, but I'm pushing one of the pots up, I'm lifting it up, and then I'm asking, okay, what's the water level? Then that's much more complicated to do. We can do that too. And when you're modeling weather or concentration of chemicals in the atmosphere, you have to solve lots of differential equations like this, and some of them can be very, very tricky to solve. Usually they're done numerically by giant computers that don't care what the equation is, they just integrate it the way a graphing calculator doesn't care what the function is, it just graphs it. Okay, so let's try separating variables. I look at this equation and I want everything with TR on the left and everything with T or DT on the right. And I can pretty much see how to do that. I can just divide both sides by this guy on the right and multiply both sides by dt and I get this great big equation here. dtr divided by 5.5 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 2 tr equals dt. Good. 
Now I can solve that because this side only depends on TR, so I can integrate it. And this side only depends on time, so I can integrate it. That's why I have to separate the variables. And so I put an integral on each side, and I say, okay, I'm going to integrate from the concentration of trans at some time I'm going to call zero, which is when I start the experiment, maybe, or start the stopwatch. And I'm going to integrate up to some concentration of trans at time t. And then over here, I'm going to integrate time from zero to t. Strictly speaking, this is sloppy notation because usually the variable you're integrating over and the limits, you don't like to use the same letter because sometimes it's confusing. If I were really doing this correctly, I should call this dx and integrate it from zero to t, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because we can get the answer. The right hand side is just t minus zero because the integral of dt is t and I evaluate it at the top limit and the bottom limit and I subtract them so I get t minus zero is t that's this side and the right hand side we can either hand over to integrals.com if we're lazy or we can make a substitution we can call u equals the denominator 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 0.01 TR and if I do that which I'll do just for fun we can set up the integral and this is what you would probably do if you were doing it by hand I have this new variable u it's 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 0.01 TR <coughs> and I take its derivative so I know what du is and that the derivative of a constant is zero and the derivative of TR is just dTR so I end up with minus one times ten to the minus two dTR and then I solve this for dTR dTR is minus a hundred du and at t equals zero TR is TR zero and therefore U at time zero is 5.59 times 10 to the minus 3 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 2 TR at time zero and the upper limit is just the same thing U at time T is this minus this times the concentration of trans at time T and then I put all those into the equation so I get something I can solve. When I put all these in, this minus one and this 10 to the minus two comes outside, and now I'm integrating du over u, and I, can, I know that's the natural log, because now I have it in a form I can recognize it. The other side is t, and that means the log, natural log of u at time t minus the natural log of u at time zero is equal to, I brought this thing over here, minus one times 10 to the minus two t. And I'll just remark if, as long as you make the variable x and you hand this thing like that to integrals.com, it'll give you the answer straight away. The variable has to be x for that particular website. And we know when we subtract logs, it's the same as dividing the arguments, so we can clean this, tidy this up. We now have this, the natural log of u at time t divided by u at time zero is equal to minus one times 10 to the minus two times t. And then if I take the exponential function to get rid of the log, I end up with the following answer. Our, our new variable u at time t 
is equal to our variable u at time zero times e to the minus t over 100. The reason why the exponential function is so important is that lots of differential equations depend on how much stuff you've got. Compound interest, for example, is an exponential equation. You just plunk the money in and you leave it and you get 8% interest and you end up extremely rich in 30 years because it keeps going up and up and up and as there's more money in the account the interest is more and then the, there's even more and then the interest is even more etc etc <coughs> on the other hand if you borrow money then you're going down like an exponential especially if you keep borrowing more and more, more, and more money I'm, I'm amused at the credit card offers I get to get rid of my debt by transferring the debt to someone else. So you notice you didn't get rid of anything, but now you're paying the interest to them. That's what they're interested in. If you're a good risk, they want to get the 17% or whatever they're charging, uh, or even 29%, I guess, if you're unlucky and miss a payment and don't read the fine print. Okay, then now we don't we don't like this. This is a nice equation, but it has u. It doesn't have the concentration of trans in it. So I have to go back and I have to substitute in the whole thing to obtain the final answer. I put in all this stuff for u at time t, and I put in all the other stuff for u at time zero. And now I have an equation where I have to solve now for trans at time t, but basically I'm there. And I can predict now from any starting place how much trans I'm going to have at any time. And here's the final result. The amount of trans at time t is 0.559. Not surprisingly, that's the equilibrium concentration. And it, you notice it doesn't have any time on it. That means as time goes on, it's going to settle down to this number. And then, whatever the difference between where I start and the equilibrium amount and then multiply by e to the minus t over 100. When you multiply anything by e to a negative exponential, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So this part here dies out and I end up with the equilibrium concentration. We had an assumption here that we started at, at 1.0 but that was my first initial thing where I got rid of C. If now that we have more, more confidence, we could certainly go back and we could say, look, let the total amount of stuff be C naught or anything. And we could do it again. And then we'd have a completely general answer to this particular problem. OK, just to emphasize, will you have to do this? No. Not now, and certainly not under the pressure of an exam. However, yes, eventually, you will have to do things like this and much, much harder things. Because if you can't do things like this and much, much harder things, then you're down there with everybody else who also can't do that. If you can do something that other people can't do, you tend to get a job that they can't get. That's how that works. They have requirements. Can you do this kind of computer programming? Are you familiar with this process? Have you ever done this? And so forth. And if you have, you're a good candidate. Even if you do use modern software, you can get mixed up if you don't understand how the equations are behaving and what you're supposed to be uh, trying to get. Most people view mathematics as something scary or difficult. But in fact, mathematics is the quickest, cleanest shortcut. That's why we make mathematical models of the universe, because mathematics problems are much easier to solve than vague problems in words. Whenever somebody says something 
about the future in words and they don't have any mathematics behind it, then you have to ask how they're going to get, get it to happen. I will create 250,000 jobs. How? What's the equation? Show me the curve that goes up and levels off at 250,000. Why'd you pick that number? Why isn't it 253,000 or 225,000? And what exactly are you going to do to create jobs out of thin air if there's no work to be done or no people who can do the work that's required? It gets much, much more complicated then to implement something like that. Let's plot our results. Since we've got an equation, we can see exactly how many molecules we're going to create. Let's suppose we start with, with no trans at all. It's all 100% cis. How long does it take to get to equilibrium? Well, we've got an exact solution, so we plot it. So I started with 100% 1.0 of cis and 0.0 .0 of trans and I just put those into the equations and I plotted it versus time here in seconds and I can see that after about 300 seconds or so it settled down and that lets me know how long I have to wait in the lab before I make a measurement if I want to know the equilibrium concentration as a function of temperature or pressure for this system, if these rate constants are correct, then I have to change the temperature and then I have to go get a cup of coffee because I have to wait 300 seconds at least before I can know that it isn't moving around anymore, settle down. And chemical engineers really like to know exactly how long they have to wait. They're bunging in chemicals and they want something to come out how long do I have to treat the wastewater? How long does it have to cycle around in there before it's clean enough or it's as clean as it's ever going to get? And then I, then I get rid of it. Now, it's very important to know these uh, kinds of things. Sometimes the only way you can know is by careful measurement because you don't know these rate constants very well. If we start with no cis isomer, about how long is it? So now I've got the opposite. I start with 100% trans and some of it starts immediately going backwards because Q is bigger than K so it starts making cis and it takes about the same amount of time, about 300 seconds in it's leveled off. And I would get the same conclusion no matter what I started with because these are the two extremes. If I'm lucky and I started with the equilibrium concentration, they both flatline all the way across. So here's the conclusion. The time it takes to establish equilibrium depends on the size of the individual rate constants more than the initial conditions. If the rate constants are fast, that means it's going to settle down very, very quickly. It means instantly I'll have equilibrium. If the rate constants are very slow, I'm going to have to wait forever <coughs> to let equilibrium establish. On the other hand, the final concentrations don't depend on whether the rate constants are both big or both small. The final concentrations only depend on the ratio of the rate constants. How fast is this guy shoveling stuff in and how fast is the other guy shoveling stuff back? That ratio is going to tell how much I've got at equilibrium. And these same conclusions apply to processes like biological fermentation, which they're using to produce things like fuel and drugs. I'm growing yeast. I want to heat it up maybe to get the reaction to, to go better, growth and other reactions that we'd like to be able to control. The equilibrium result of a bunch of fresh raspberries is the raspberries spoil. They mold 
they start smelling bad and so forth. And if you leave them out on the counter, that happens very quickly. If you put them in the refrigerator, the same thing happens. But you usually don't leave them there so long that you notice it's happening. It just happens much, much more slowly. If you take food and put it in a freezer, it also spoils, but it spoils much, much more slowly. And if you put it in a deep freezer or liquid nitrogen, it spoils very, 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 very slowly. And so it keeps a very long time. And for each 10 degrees Fahrenheit you go down, you can keep the food in there a lot longer. Assuming it can tolerate being frozen. Sometimes if you freeze things, they change. So frozen raspberries aren't the same as fresh because of the uh, ice crystals rupturing things inside the fruit. Okay, now let's talk about something which we will definitely have on Tuesday, which is we're going to add reactions. And we know that when we add reactions, any state function, big H, any big capital letter, big S, big G, they all add. And let's then <coughs> talk about, suppose we have this reaction, <coughs> this reaction in the, uh, the 60s was a big problem because coal has a lot of other stuff in it, in particular sulfur. And high sulfur coal is a lot cheaper than low sulfur coal because it's not, not because of this reaction, basically. If we burn the coal to produce power and we have sulfur in it, then we also make SO2, so just like the C in the, in the coal, the carbon makes CO2, the sulfur makes SO2, and if delta G for that reaction is delta G1, and I have another reaction where I take SO2, and it goes up into the air, and it reacts over time with oxygen in the air, out of the smokestack, then it makes SO3, SO3 is called sulfuric acid anhydride. If I add water to it, I get sulfuric acid. When a lot of coal plants in Ohio were burning a lot of coal and there were no emissions controls, the SO3 would drift over Canada up north and then mix with water and rain down on all their nice forests, and that was the so-called acid rain problem. The trees would defoliate because the pH of the ground was changing, and also if you just spray dilute sulfuric acid onto the leaves of plants or pine needles, they don't like it. It's too acidic for them. And so the trees wouldn't grow, and in Canada, of course, they're doing a lot of lumbering. They have a lot of people cutting down trees turning them into planks and selling them. And if their trees don't grow, that business is dead. And so there was quite a tug of war. You've got to stop burning this stuff. That's your problem. But that drifts up there. You find another kind of tree. Well, eventually they said, well, okay, we'll stop this SO2 going up. But that cost a ton of money because now you have to put something on the smokestack that captures the SO2, and then you have to take it out, and you have to keep it clean, and that costs a lot of money, and where am I going to put it? What am I going to do with it? Can I sell this material for any purpose, or is it just junk that's dangerous and toxic that I've got to somehow figure out what I'm going to do with it? It depends. Well, if we add those reactions up, and we just imagine doing it in one step, then the SO2s go away here, and I have a net reaction, sulfur, elemental sulfur, and three halves of molecular oxygen gives SO3. Delta G for this reaction, whatever it is, is just the sum of this one and the sum of this one. We just add them up. If we turn a reaction around, 
we change the sign of delta G because we changed the initial and final state. And if we carry out these two reactions at the same temperature, then I can multiply by minus one and divide by RT, and I have instead of this equation, minus delta G over RT is equal to, I'm sorry, minus delta G one over RT, plus minus delta G two over RT, and that's of, of interest because that means since delta G over RT, minus delta G over RT is log K, that means that log K adds up. So log K for the total reaction is log K1 plus log K2. But I know how logs work. I can always combine them. If I add them, I multiply them and take the log of the total. If I divide them, I subtract them. And then I can, if the log of K is equal to the log of K1, K2, that means that K is equal to K1, K2. Therefore, if we add two chemical reactions, we multiply the equilibrium constants. Let me say that one more time. If we add two chemical reactions, we multiply the equilibrium constants for the reaction. The reason why this is not just academic is because one of these reactions might be unfavorable. It might be one we want to run, but it's not going anywhere because K is tiny. But if we couple it to another reaction that is favorable, then we can drive the whole lot to go what, to where we want. And that's what chemists always do. Chemists run a ton of unfavorable reactions as do all living things. They assemble these gigantic molecules that are very, very low entropy, and they do so by running a ton of other reactions that are favorable, like burning up glucose with oxygen to make CO2. That's a favorable reaction. So as long as I can eat, and I can run that favorable reaction, then I can run un un a lot of unfavorable reactions, like get smarter. Okay? But if I can't eat anything, I can't get any smarter. And if I eat too much, I won't get smart either. Because then the blood ends up in your stomach and your brain needs blood to work. So before the exam, you don't just eat a ton of stuff because then you'll fall asleep in the exam. That's the natural result. You look at a lion that's hungry, how does it look? Right? Very alert. That's the way you want to be for an exam. What's the problem? You look at a lion that's just finished a giraffe. It's a dead, right? It's asleep. It's digesting all that food, all the blood's in its stomach, doing all that biochemistry. You only want to do one thing at a time, so you come into the exam hungry, and then after the exam, you eat and relax but don't get the order wrong, because if you do, you won't do as well. Okay, let's finish up by talking about Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle is just that if we have a system at equilibrium and we change something, how will the equilibrium shift? Or will the equilibrium shift at all? Well, Le Chatelier worked this out. <coughs> and made the following general statement. The equilibrium will always shift in the direction that tends to counteract whatever the change is. For example, and we worked this out in some detail, if we increase the pressure in the Haber reaction to make ammonia, then we saw that we made a lot more ammonia, the right hand side, because making more ammonia minimizes the number of moles of gas and counteracts the increased pressure. When I squeeze on a chemical system, it tries to get smaller if it can. And if it can get smaller, it does. And in this case, that's our 
lever to get more product out of the reaction. Okay, so let's consider a reaction to synthesize FOS genes. Don't try this at home. Very, very, very reactive guy, this guy. <coughs> Let's take molecular chlorine and carbon monoxide and make phosgene, COCl2. It has a carbon, double bond oxygen, and two chlorines sticking out like a triangle. And let's consider the effect of the following changes. Let's suppose we have the reaction at equilibrium. What will be the effect of each of the following on the concentration of carbon monoxide? One, I inject additional chlorine. Two, I add argon gas and I make the total pressure higher. The total pressure is higher because I've pumped in argon. But argon doesn't react with the other guys. Three, I just compress the mixture by increasing the pressure. Or four, I decompress the mixture by lowering the pressure. Okay, let's go through them then one by one. First, we'll start with injecting additional chlorine. If I add additional chlorine, I'm going to increase the denominator in Q because Q has the concentration of phosgene and in the denominator the concentration of chlorine times the concentration of carbon monoxide. Q is K at equilibrium and K doesn't change. Therefore, if I add more chlorine in the denominator, I'm going to have to get less CO. Otherwise, it's not going to work and I'm going to get more product. And this is another clue. <coughs> Suppose I have two reactants. One of them is extremely expensive, and the other one is cheap as dirt, and I want to use up the expensive reagent so I don't waste it. Then what I do is I just pile in the dirt until I drive it over to the other side. And if the dirt cheap reagent is a gas, it's great because I can pile it in, get the product, isolate the product, and then vent the gas off, assuming it's harmless. Okay? That's another trick. Two, adding a get inert gas does not shift the equilibrium. Why not? I just said if we increase the pressure, we shift the equilibrium if the number of moles of gas of products and reactants is different. And now I'm saying I'm increasing the pressure, but nothing's happening. The answer is argon is not in Q, the reaction quotient. If I don't change the reaction quotient, I can't change any of the concentrations of the things. So although the total pressure in the container is higher, because I didn't actually change the reaction quotient, I just added something else that doesn't react nothing changes. So there's no change in equilibrium if I add an inert gas. If on the other hand I squeeze on it like this and compress it, then I'm going to get more product because there's again Q, if I, th if I work it out with the moles of gas there's going to be a P uh, standard over P left over, and so if I increase the pressure, I'm going to decrease the number of moles of CO. And so, not surprisingly, if I expand it, then I'm going to shift it and get more CO, because some of this phosgene will actually react backwards and make both CO and Cl2, and I'll get more CO. And that's how we keep track of it. 
So here's the summary. If I change the concentration of something in the chemical equation, not something else, but something that participates in Q, the reaction quotient, then I'm going to shift the equilibrium, but I'm not going to change the equilibrium constant. If I put pressure on a gas, I'm going to shift the equilibrium, potentially, if the number of moles of gas is different, but I'm not going to change the equilibrium constant. If I change the volume, I'm going to shift the equilibrium, but not, not change the equilibrium constant. If I shift the temperature, ah, log K minus delta G over RT, I know then that the equilibrium is going to shift and the equilibrium constant is going to shift. And if I add a catalyst to make the equilibrium come more quickly, a catalyst, strictly speaking, this is never true, but a catalyst, a true catalyst, is unchanged. So if it starts on the reactant side, catalyst plus blah, 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 and then on the product side is products plus the same catalyst, the catalyst cancels out because whatever its concentration is, it's in the numerator and the denominator. So if it's a true catalyst, it can't shift the equilibrium. It just makes the equilibrium happen more quickly. Really what happens is the catalyst gets dinged <coughs> over time because our reagents aren't 100% pure, and if we've got a tiny, tiny amount of some bad guy in there, it wrecks the catalyst. That's why the oil companies had to get rid of all the sulfur in the gasoline because it was reacting with the platinum and palladium in the catalytic converter and making it fail. And there was a big battle. You guys make a better catalytic converter. You guys get the sulfur out of the gas. We can't make a better catalytic converter. Okay, so usually the oil companies and the auto companies are on the same page, but not always. When, whenever one's going to have to try to do something very hard that's going to cost a ton of money, then they try to say, well, the other guy should do something very hard that costs a ton of money. Instead, the result of that is that we have gas that doesn't have as much sulfur in it. Okay, we'll finish up here with a few subscripts on K. There's lots of little subscripts on K, and they're, they're all Ks. They're all ratios of products and reactants. And they're just meant to be descriptive. So if I have K sub A, that means this reaction. That means an acid dissociates to give H plus and the anion. And here's the formula for K. And if I have KB, that refers to a base. I have a base. It pulls a proton off water it makes hydroxide. So I could have a neutral here, like ammonia plus water gives ammonium ion plus hydroxide. That's why they tend to put ammonia into things like Windex, okay? Because it gives the right amount. You say, why don't they put Drano in Windex and make hydroxide that way? And the answer is, It'll leave a residue on the glass, number one, because it won't evaporate like ammonia. And number two, it's usually too strong, and if I make it too basic, I'll actually start affecting the glass. I'll actually start polishing away the glass, so my glass window is getting thinner and thinner as I keep cleaning it over time, and that's a bad strategy to do that. Okay, next time what we'll do is work some problems, okay, which will be good ones to note.